Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is actress Justine Rice and artist Pierre Picot. Actress Justine Rice was raised in Northern California, Sacramento to be exact, went <laughs> east to Brandeis University for her Bachelor of Arts, spent two years at a theater company in Pennsylvania, then worked for Disney in Orlando. What were you doing at Disney? Oh, the big question. Um, it's Justine Reese, by the way. Oh, it is? So, yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Um, I was doing improv theater, and then I, most of the time, I was in the stunt show. Oops, so, we're losing our, our, we're we're losing our, our art. Uh, it's okay. So I did uh, stunt work in the Indiana Jones stunt show, and I but, hosted shows. But you were a stunt woman. I was a stunt woman. I did, did high falls and stage fights. And what did you, how did you train to do that? Well, you know, actually, I worked in the at a Renaissance fair for a couple of years, and I learned some stage oh. combat. And I, I was a dancer, so that stuff was always really fun for me. And um, I just sort of fell into it. No pun intended, but. But you did fall. Did yeah. you have to do a lot? Did, well, we had to what? learn how to do high falls, which is something I had never done. And then I did it out here for a while, too, at the Universal. How high? Um, the <laughs> highest I ever did was 30 feet. You do? You have yeah. to learn how to fall like yeah. that? Yeah. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> and a slide for life. That was kind of that was fun, where you slide down a big, you know, it's kind of a circus trick. Wait, did it help you in your TV career? Well, honestly, I didn't really choose to pursue that out here because I felt that the women that were really pursuing it were a lot crazier than I was. Yeah, so they're I, really. Yeah. I mean, they're and part they're of also, the stunt women's association. Yeah, and they're. Tra How different were they? Um, how different were they? Well, I would say they, you know, I didn't get to do work with them so much because I had such small roles in those films, but I would say that they have, um, Coppola is a lot more hands-on, that was my experience anyway, it, and uh, Avnet was a little, a little more aloof with uh, the way he worked. And did so. the roles start getting bigger and bigger? Oh, well, we only can hope. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've actually kind of focused on doing a lot of voiceover in the last few years. I know. I had a baby, that. and so that fit into my lifestyle better, and that's what I've kind of focused on. But for movies or for uh, commercials or uh, for commercials, what? promos, animation, I'll, I, I would like to be doing more animation because it's really so, so much fun and so creative. But do you have to have a special kind of agent to get those voiceovers? A voiceover or? agent, yes, absolutely. voiceover agent. I know, it's ridiculous. What about stage? You and, need an agent for that? Well, you kind of do. Unfortunately, in L.A., there's not enough stage. Mostly, most of the time, your theatrical agent can get you in on, you know, big equity auditions. Or uh -huh. In New York, it's much more important because there's so much. To have a stage agent? Yeah. Well, I think they call that there legit, and we call it theatrical out here. So. You're doing uh, a play right now. Yeah. Uh, with the Chautauqua Theatre Company. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. All right, the Chautauqua Theatre Alliance is heading into their second season. Um, they were founded last year. Um, we're a non-exclusive, non-membership based company, which is kind of unusual in Los Angeles. We're a not-for-profit organization. We have a subscription base. We're uh, trying to do things a little differently. A lot of companies in Los Angeles are dues paying. The members actually have to pay dues to keep the theater company oh, alive. Is, is that what oh, I see. And it's, it is very hard to produce theater in Los Angeles. We've chosen not to do that, so we're not tied to that specific group of people. We can reach out to people like Dave Moore. Um, Your director. Are you mean to go out to different yes, people? Yes, and that's part of what Chautauqua wants to do. We want to get out there, and we co-produce shows with other companies. But are they all actors? Um, 
No, not necessarily. Matt Scarpino is our technical director. And oh, they don't have active. to be actors. No, but he's on the board, and we have five members I mean. on the board. Right. They're, no, they don't have to be. In fact, it's probably better if they're not. <laughs> How did you get together? How did they um, all get together? We all have met doing shows in town with other theater companies, and we had a mutual respect. Um, I came along actually in the second wave of the board. The board was formed um. last year, and um, we've all worked together. and. I've produced a few shows in town, so I kind of have cut my teeth doing that a little bit too. We all are, you know, jack of all trades in the company. Everybody you have to everything. be, I guess. Yeah. The play that I saw was Abstract Expressionism at the Egyptian Arena, right. which is a small theater, 99, 99 seat. 99 seat house, yeah. And tell us a little. Expression <laughs> by Teresa Rebeck, who's a fabulous female playwright. Um, and it's about the art world in Manhattan, where art and commerce meet, and how this meeting affects three families and practically tears them apart. You play a, a really owner. ruthless. I think you're ruthless. She's a little. We've been trying to work against that because it's just so there how ruthless but, she is. But that's what she is. she is. I mean, who did you style yourself after? Uh, <laughs> I wonder if it was Mary Boone. I got tipped off in the green room about that. Is that right? <laughs> well, actually, I, I thought it was I Mary Boone. I have to be Boone. honest with you. I hadn't found a lot of research about gallery owners per se. I did my research more about the art world and kind of tried to go down to, I went down to Bergamon Station. I wondered if you researched the part. Did you see? Because there's a lot of women directors in Bergamon Station yeah. and in Los Angeles, but nobody quite like Mary right. Boone, Annalise uh, Judah in London. Right. Um, some, some different people in New York. I thought it would be interesting to inform the character more by learning about the art itself as opposed to, but I am, I am interested in, in reading more about these women. The person so who plays the role of the artist looks like Mark DeSouvreau, mm -hmm. who is a great sculptor. Right. And I felt like the way it was written, it reminded me of Richard Pousset Dart, who has two children, a son and a daughter. Right. And that felt like felt like it to me. The other thing it felt like was Picasso, almost, when Paloma yeah. and her brother Cla were going and visiting in the south of France. A little misogynistic quality there. That part of it, but also where she sees, you know, his work as being so beautiful. Mm -hmm. and, and just the, the emotion of, uh, of that being so much about the relationship is his painting. And my grandmother was a painter, and I, oh. I have her paintings hanging all over my house, and I feel like she's a, it, with me. You know, it really, there is so much of a life that is left in that canvas. When... Um, you started working on this, and your director Dave Moore came to the to direct you. Mm -hmm. Does he have a certain style that you? Hmm. You should probably ask him that. <laughs> um, I think that uh, he. One great thing is he let us he let us find a lot of things on our own, but then really kind of tried without setting strict boundaries but let us um, discover and then kind of reel us in and let us fly off in certain areas when well, it was appropriate. When you sit down to do something because this is a West Coast premiere right? Yes it is. Uh -huh. uh, where, did it play in New York? It was at the Long Wharf in a workshop production. So do you sit around and talk about the artist? Do you talk? Do you go to art galleries together? Do you do things that kind of revolve around this play? Probably in a utopian ideal world we would all go out on field trips and go do those things together. I did a lot of that on my own. Um, I saw a lot of documentaries. I hung out a lot of galleries. I talked to a lot of gallery owners just to sort of immerse myself in that world and see if they, I could... F and I did see some interesting personalities and gallery owners that uh, you know, they're not always, they, they don't always open up their arms when you walk in the gallery, but the bottom line is, you know, you could be their next big client. And so... You could be like the patron who was in the play. Absolutely. I mean, it's an intimidating environment. Very intimidating, which is kind of interesting. For people to come into it? I found it very see, intimidating to just walk into a gallery and sort of, it's quiet, and there's all this art on the walls, and, you know. But it was interesting, because you were looking for something. Right. So maybe uh, right, and that that is that is true, but I but um, and maybe if I came in and I had the huge checkbook, maybe you don't feel that. You wouldn't way. feel that way. The other thing mm -hmm. is, I think they always say museums are intimidating, mm -hmm. and I never think of them as intimidating. Right. But maybe going into an art gallery, it's it's different than a museum because it seems like you're walking to somebody's home almost. Uh. Because most gallery owners 
buy art that they like. That's what I have found. Or sell art. They, or that sell they art like. that they like. Right. And they, they try and almost put not push their taste but express their taste and you become a client if you like their taste because they're going to find art that you like. It's very so, true because yeah. you always tell an artist go talk to so and so because your work looks like what she likes. Exactly. Exactly. So what are you going to do um, when the play finishes <laughs> in Chautauqua? Can you be yeah. in all the productions? Well, if there's roles and, you know, I don't th I'm sure I'll be too worn out to do the next production, but I have a two-year-old son, too, so that it's, it's a You're lot doing a play. Lucky. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lucky I you. <laughs> I am. Terrible twos. But, um, you know, we're, we'll, we'll get working on the next production. I'll be involved in that, you know. Some in some extent. way? Yes. Oh, and I see. So being part of the company, you'll be... Well, you'll I'm on the board. The company is sort of a loose is term. It because Well, it's different because we don't have a membership base. So we don't have a theater company that, you know, only certain people can perform in certain plays. And it's kind of nice because we don't, you know, we don't have to look at oh, the role of the painter and say, well, we really don't have a 60-year-old guy to play that. I guess we'll, you know, we'll, we'll age up a 35-year-old guy, you know, uh, or something like that. Yeah, that's what We're I was wondering. We're able to go out and, um, you know, go into ba breakdowns and seek uh, out agents. And otherwise, in a company, you always have to use the people who are there, Yeah, because that, they're kind of paying money for uh, that. <laughs> And, like and learning. It's a learning si yes, situation, it is. too. Isn't and I it? would say Chautauqua is also a learning situation. And we have, we do co productions. 15 Minutes of Femme is this great thing we're producing, co producing with Good Dog Productions, ah. which is uh, four women get up and this great female energy. Um, it's, it starts two weekends from now, and then the best of is February 17th after we close. Wonderful event. So, do you take part in that? Um, I haven't because I don't really have a one woman show, but if I did. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's I 15 see, minutes yeah. of just you up there. Some of it's stand up comedy, some of it's one woman show, some of it's just cathartic, you know. <laughs> it's some really, you should come and see it. It's really, I really will. wonderful. And I'm so glad you came, Justine Reese. Yes, thank you. Thank <laughs> and abstract expression. I didn't get to talk about Teresa at all, but she's a, oh, a yeah. really fabulous the, playwright. The playwright. Yeah, we, lives we in met New York. At, at Brandeis University, and she lives in New York. And, and she's written a lot of yeah, uh, for TV, yeah, too. Yeah, she writes, uh, co-producers Law and Order, uh, NYPD Blue, uh, she worked on Brooklyn Bridge. So has she used you in any of those things? Yes, actually. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> I thought she's not, she's in New York now, but and well, I'm not, so. So we'll look for those. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you very right. much. Thank you, Joan. And thanks for being with us this part of the show, and don't go away because we'll be with artist Pierre Picot when you come back. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. With us is artist Pierre Picot, who was born in Tour, France. He must have suffered culture shock moving from Europe to the Valley, where he graduated from Grant High and then went on to earn a Bachelor of Arts from UCLA and a Master of Fine Arts from uh, CalArts. Was it a problem moving from Europe to Yeah, it was horrible. Here? <laughs> it was absolutely <laughs> to horrible. To the Valley? <laughs> I was just in the Valley the other day, two days ago, driving through the area, through North Hollywood, where I'd come, you know, from one day of being in Europe and another day being in, in America. And I was just reminiscing about all these things that I'd never seen before. It, oh, know. is that, was that a big difference? Yeah. Well, it was a, a big difference in the way people dressed, uh. the way I dressed and the way the other kids dressed. You I know. thought you were young enough that maybe you could absorb it. You were a teenager, I right? I was 12 years old when yeah. I came. And I was able to absorb it, but it took time, right? It didn't happen overnight. Uh, I, I mentioned some people I came to America and I was wearing uh, pointy Italian shoes that were uh, ankle high and the kids were walking around barefoot in the valley oh. and, <laughs> and they were looking at me as if and they were mimicking a ballet dancer uh, uh, when looking at me you know, so I thought what's this about but so it, you went through all those cultural changes it took a few years yeah because France was so vivid and know. what about your your English um, at that time. Did you speak English? I spoke a little bit because we'd been in Canada oh. for a few months. Oh. And, you know, when you're 12 years old, when you're a kid, I think you can really absorb language extremely quickly, uh, like a sponge. Mm -hmm. And so it was no problem. You got your master's at um, CalArts. Mm -hmm. And are all these master's programs different? Do you choose a college that you want to take your master's program? How does that work? 
Uh, you mean back then or these days? No, now. No. Uh, well, back then, how long ago was it that you got your master's? Gosh, it was a while ago, actually. It was about 20 year, 25 years ago. Back uh, then, yeah. then. Let's see. What uh, happened? I'd heard great things about CalArts. It was just the first year on, on the new campus, ah, and it sounded like a great place to be. And I think that's what people do these days, too. They, they're kind of sniffing around for the reputation of a school. But how, do, how does the school get the reputation? From the, the um, faculty? I think they get the reputation from faculty but also from uh, the students once they get out of school and how quickly those students begin to show uh. and uh, also some of those students by the time they begin to so show are already teaching mm -hmm. and they bring the, the, the influence back to the school that they came from. Oh, so all of that plays into it. I wondered how the master's program really stood out with its own personality at right. each school. I think it's word of mouth. Tons of people are talking about it. You, you know that the students, once they're out, or once, uh, you know, because the students are going out to galleries all the time. Uh, oh. They're running around, meeting each other from other schools, impromptu, but, you know, that's what they talk about. What school do you go to? What kind of school is it? Who teaches there? Ah, well, you're really a part of it because you do teach. Right. And where do you teach now? I teach at Art Center in Pasadena. And so you probably come in contact with that kind of uh, chitter chat. I, I come in contact with the chatter a lot, yes. How did uh, you choose to go there? Um, actually, it chose me. Oh, it chose you. Uh, it chose me because I, I, <coughs> at the time that it chose me, which was in the mid-1980s, I was showing a lot, and I got a phone call to come as a visiting artist. And I think it's really important for the schools to do that, you know, to keep things fresh. <coughs> they, they, they bring in artists who are working and showing. I wanted to ask you about that because you did do a lot of visiting art, visiting uh, lectures, visiting, mm -hmm. visit, what do you call it? Um, <laughs> Guest artists. Uh, yeah, residencies. <laughs> right, right, what right. What are the difference in those kind of things? What's a residency? Well, uh, I think residency, what you're referring to is when you go and um, for, let's say, a month, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, uh, go to some kind of foundation and work there under their sponsorship. You did that. You did that in Europe, did you? Uh, did you have residencies there? No, I've tried to get those residencies, but not too hard. <laughs> I've been more uh, just a, a visiting artist, a visiting I lecturer. I see. Which is, uh, you, you, it's like a, a, an itinerant. Uh, teacher, as it were. Do you stay there for a period of time if you're a visiting lecturer? Uh, usually for a term. Oh, it's not, you don't just go in and give one lecture. No, no, That's no. That's what you, I was wondering. No, you, you, you know, you have maybe you either have a, a full-time thing, or you have one course that you teach once or twice a week. I see. Exactly. I see. Yeah. So you, can you do that at two or three different places? Uh, yes, uh, I would rather not. Um, it's simply because you find yourself traveling around, which I think is is one of the dilemmas that a lot of people who, uh. who don't who who teach but don't have a f a formal uh, a full time uh, situation uh, find themselves uh, on the freeway constantly. Uh, and then you don't have time to paint. Then you don't have to do anything. You know, all you have time to do is figure out your bills and figure out your your homework, housework, and. Uh, You're teaching a course uh, at Art Center that's quite. Innovative, I uh -huh. think. I don't know what it's called. Obscurity uh, and genius. Uh, actually, I just finished teaching it at, at the graduate school at Otis, and uh, if if I, uh, they might actually take well, me tell on. me about it. It's anyway. called obscurity slash genius. And That's the name of the course. Ob how do they know what to take? And uh, how do you describe well, it? Well, I give them a synopsis, and and the whole premise of it is the fact that. Um, I felt for a long, long time that there, were been, there have been so many artists, so many fantastic artists and art forms uh, that have literally slipped through the cracks of art history for all sorts of reasons which I find objectionable. Right? We're given a pantheon, we're given um, an A-list of the artists that matter, and we right. stick to that uh, whether or not we have seen other people's work. But if they've slipped through the cracks, so mm -hmm. to speak, how do we know? Is there is there work out there? How do you find these obscure geniuses, I guess is what you're calling them? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you, you develop a sense of curiosity. I'm really curious. Uh, I like to go look around the corner. I like to peek around in the dark rooms of museums. I love to travel. I go to, uh, to strange provincial places. And I come across uh, um, images. I come across 
across artists, I come across objects that just uh, hold my attention and stop me in my track. And then you start researching them? And then I start researching. I, I do detective work. And is that what your students would do? Do they I, come up with names or do you come up with the names? Uh, in, in the situation at, at, at Otis, I asked them to uh, go out and seek someone uh, who may have struck them at some point and do some detective oh. work and then uh, present a whole program, an audio-visual uh, lecture uh, about that individual artist. Uh, is it easy to find those things? Is no. it easy to find, <laughs> to find art that's painted by someone like that? Mm -hmm. Or is it a second-tier artist who <laughs> maybe started with a group and is included, say, in that, say, I don't know, New York Modern. Is it somebody who started in that and then all of a sudden he dropped down at the bottom or he wasn't fashionable? He didn't, you know, he didn't schmooze with the right people. He didn't hang out in the Hamptons. Uh, he right. didn't have sex with blah, blah, blah. Who knows? Um, but is there a lot of his work around? And, and yet there's that, there that work if you stretch, scratch the surface. One of the good, good ways to start these days, of course, is to Google that well, person, right? But it's a lot different now. It's easier I, to do that the, now. The, um, be, the, the getting through to the surf, uh, through the surface to to some bits of information is easier. Uh -huh. um, and also, it's easier if you if you've already done it before, and you're willing to kind of immerse yourself in a, a situation that's fairly uncharted. And if you feel comfortable in an un uncharted situation then, you know, time will fulfill your research in unexpected ways, and that's have, the pleasure. Have any of your students found people that you had actually known about, or uh, did they, have they come up with something really interesting? Uh, well, I'll tell you, the fascinating thing that happened at Otis is that here are these very sophisticated um, art students who are, um, uh, very uh, academically oriented in the program and I would say 75 percent of the students came up with uh, artists whose work was so unlike their own personal work. That's interesting. And it, it was really about this is the work that I really like in this artist and it has nothing to do with my kind of work which I thought was extremely revealing and which I thought was at the core or I think is at the core of, of, of the class which is Stand up for your own opinions. Uh, challenge the givens of the pantheon. So you taught them. I mean, you actually brought this about and taught this to these students. I think it becomes obvious once they start seeing what I'm showing them uh -huh. that, yeah, uh, why not have trust and faith in my oh, instinct I when I look at somebody's work, be it the mask maker from New Mexico right. or the Lithuanian symbolist or God knows what, you know. That's, that's great. Um, and I want to talk about you a little bit because you have a painting show up that's called A Thousand Drawings of... It's called Selections from a Thousand Drawings <laughs> it's from called. the series uh, Ecstatic Manifestations of the Physical Universe. Thank you, because I couldn't say all of that. <laughs> and we have a couple of them here on the set. Right. And we have more here. Right, it's just an ongoing series uh, of... Uh, what, what media is this? It's all uh, ink on uh, watercolor paper. It's all done with brushes. And all the same size? All the same size, all black and white, all very um, very much a part of a very long and e not exhausting, but exhaustive uh, uh, series, which I can lose up. myself in and, and immerse I'll myself this. in. And um, yeah, they all kind of... I'm two or three of them up like this. And then if you have something to say, like this looks like a whirlwind. Yeah. Well, they're all about uh, after, after the fact, they all seem to be, for me, about physical energy, about, uh, as I say, uh, the, the, the title came after the fact of doing maybe a hundred, you know, about the physical universe um, and what I see in that world. And uh, it, it had to be, or it has to be, or a, a very active and dynamic place and situation. And you can see the, dy the dynamic atmosphere going on. It's a lot of moving. Right, right. Let me, let me hold up. I love these. They look so great. 
Yeah, so right now there's a show of these at uh, Cal State San Bernardino, about 70 miles away from Los Angeles, <laughs> out towards Did you ever trains. teach there? Never have, no, no. And are they all on, on wall, all next to each other on walls? How's it installed? They're hung on wires like you would uh, uh, oh. wet laundry on, uh, on the line. They're just uh, strung and connected with little pins and, you know. You, you went, won or were awarded a National Endowment of the Arts in 1987. Uh -huh. Did that make an impact on your career? No. It didn't? Not at all. Well, was what was it? What was? Tell me. Well, what was fascinating about that, by, by the time I got that, that NEA, I had more or less quit the gallery that I was with for, mm -hmm. I had quit two years prior to that. And I was rather surprised to get that award. Um, and it was a nice sum of money at the time, and uh, it came in handy. Um, did they? Did you know that you were being investigated, or well, being, I um, you applied. For I applied it. for it. Yes. I applied for it, and at the time that I received it, uh, it turned out that a lot of colleagues from Southern California had gotten them as well. Oh, that's great! So I think somebody was really nice from the jury. I think somebody from our our lo part of the world was on the jury. Well, I'm glad because I'm glad I think too. it's great, and I'm so glad you came to talk to us today, Pierre. It's a pleasure being with you, John. And you. thank you for watching. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor. 917 and we'll see you next time and I have a couple of photographs of Pierre doing some portrait painting so with his friends <laughs>